Dani Kusukapini. My English name is Florence Scout. I'm from the Blood Reserve. I was born and raised on the Blood Reserve, and I'm still here. Tell us a bit about your experience in, in addictions. Well, in I must have been about. I was in my early 20s, well, I was in my, about the middle 20s, I got into alcohol and it really ruined my life, ruined my children and my marriage was, it just never worked. That's where, um, Domestic abuse was really bad because there was no help, nothing. So what I did was I ran with my children, but I was right into alcohol. And I ended up losing my children. I ended up on the streets. And I, I drank for about I stayed on the streets for about four or five years and I had good jobs and and I I worked to drink for my addiction just so I could drink because I didn't have kids to support and but I in nineteen seventeen eight I heard I ended up in the detox in Calgary, and I heard about uh, a treatment center, Claris Home, and I went there. And in 1978, for a whole year, I I quit. I I, but I had no support. I had no no place to go. So what I did was I fell back into what I was doing. In 1979, the fall of 79, I came home and I, uh, I went into St. Paul's and I went the traditional way. I had elders come in and talk to me and I wouldn't listen to them and I thought you know yeah you're just as much of a big drunk as I am and George Goodstriker was the one that told me one day he told me do you want to go into the sweat we're going to have a sweat he said it's good for you it'll uh, it'll help you I said okay I went in and that's where I started dealing with, you know, why why my my body was rejecting uh, everything everything else that they were trying to help me with. Even my diet, you know, they tried to feed us really good vegetables. But it was all up here that I was against. I didn't want to sober up. I didn't want to do this. I thought, well, okay, I'll finish this program and I'm going to get a job and I'll do this and that. But George told me, he said, do you know what, Florence? He said, you have no faith, no faith within yourself. And you have no faith with this Chibata Piyup. I want you to take this smudge, smudge yourself, and ask this Chibata Piyup to take care of you. And I thought it was, you know, I thought it was a big joke. And it, and I, you know, I, I stayed at St. Paul every week. I used to go into the sweat. Finally, it hit me. Finally, it hit me. 
why I was drinking, why I didn't want to to do what my mother did with us to raise us was the priests and the nuns and what they did to us since at the school, all the, the physical and sexual abuse and verbal abuse. That was, that's when it, that's when it hit me. And I, I didn't want to tell anybody what happened. And, and George told me, I'm going to send you to, we're going to send you to Edmonton. You're going to get trained because you're going to make a good counselor. That's what he told me. And I told him, well, I have my kids and oh, they'll be okay. They're growing up, you know. And that's where I found myself, was in that sweat and that, that, that sweet grass, that smudge. That's where I found, that's what I needed. You know, for example, I still work as a counselor. I go to St. Paul's sometimes twice a week, sometimes once a week. I go to the women's shelter twice a week to work with, uh, to... Sometimes I'll sit there, I don't even have to say anything. They'll come out uh, and start telling me why they're drinking, why they're using. Right now it's not alcohol. It's that drug, it's the drugs, that uh, opiate and uh, the uh, fentanyl and, you, you know, you name what they're selling. And people come to the door, they want me to buy something for $40. Why, why, 40, why $40 every time somebody comes? Finally, I caught up <laughs> that drug is $40 to buy. And they'll come to my door and, and some, you know, I don't, I don't always have $40. So, you know, like, we have to, I don't know, like right now they have that, um, for example, they have that, uh, is it a treatment center or is it just a detox in standoff? I think it's uh, like, a, like a detox and then they could send you for further treatments. I wonder if there's anybody going in there for, for smudging, you know, to smudge, even to take them into a sweat. Make a special sweat for, because that's the only thing that I can think of that really helped. Ed Heavy Shields, Woodrow Good Striker, Mickey Good Striker, George Good Striker, Oliver Shouting, Birdie Eagle Speaker, myself. We all went through those, the same thing, and we all quit at the same time. Oliver, Oliver Soup was one of the ones. You know, some of them had their slips, and but it really builds a person up. It really builds. It doesn't matter what kind of a smudge they use or what kind of a who they invite to come in and talk to the clients. As long as that person knows what they're talking about, has been through that, has been through, you know, like, when I was working with my people, with the reserve, 
There's some people that would come in and tell me, I'm not going to listen to you because you're, you came off the streets. You're a street walker and you're trying to tell me not, not to drink. And it's that, you know, I never even thought of myself that way. I, I thought of them. Okay, I'm going to try and help you. And that one person that first started calling me that was, I, I, stayed, on, I stayed on him, you know, for so many, I think about two, three years. Finally, one day he came in and he told me, I want to go to treatment. He said, you won't give up, he told me. I said, it's not me. I said, it's you. Do you want that? He said, yeah. And he died from cancer, but he was sober. And, you know, like people like him I can use for example, because I... One out of maybe 50 people, if that person, if I can, you know, help that person understand why they're, why they're doing this to themselves, why they're drinking, or why they're using drugs, if I can get to that person and find out what it is, they can deal with it. I won't deal with it, but they can deal with it. Oh, yeah, this is why I'm doing this. I have to do this. It's, you know, it's not, it's not me telling you, hey, quit, and you stay. Okay, I'll quit. You know, I have one drunk out there, and he's, he quits for so long, and then, you know, and he's gone to treatment, but I don't know what they did to him, but... So what impact has this opioid crisis had on our communities? What impact it has? Well, for example, it started with our doctors. Right from the beginning, as soon as painkillers came out, we got a bottle. We finished that, we went back for more, we went back. And then codeine came out. Oh, that's better than what I had before. So here we are. And us natives, we think that one medicine, that one drug that makes us feel good, that's cure. That's, that's, that thing cured me. So we keep taking it, we keep taking it. And finally we're, we're down the road. The only thing, you know, they, those doctors should never have done that. I told that to Dr. Lowe. And I said, and now the people are so addicted to it, they'll do anything for it. I said, it's not only the native people, it's not only the, the Aboriginal people, it's everybody. I said it's it's not it's not only us. You think it's just us that, but look at what you're doing to people here. I said especially those old old ladies that are in homes. They they just fill them up with pills. So how can leadership, Nachsnoniks, <laughs> and how can they assist in the fight against fentanyl and other dangerous drugs killing our people? Well, like I said, you know, like sometimes I've listened to some of our elders and, you know, they'll say, well, I'm telling you this, you know, you know. You have to be, you know, you have to tell, you have to let that person know he's the only person that can do, do what, what, do something about his addiction to quit. He's the only person, and what you tell him, he has to take it to heart. He has to listen. A lot of them, they'll be sitting there with their phone. A lot of them will be sitting there, they'll just stare at you. You know, because they're so, 
They're so used to what they're doing. Like I always tell them, you know, no phones in here. You, you know, you're going to listen to me. And I've, I've helped quite a few girls, you know, on the, to, to quit what they're, what they're on. I seen this girl yesterday. She came over and she said, I just want to thank you for helping me. I said, yeah. I said, how did I help you? I said, you helped yourself. I said, I was only there to support you. So they're going to build a 75-bed facility out in Laverne. Really? And uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that'll help to stem the tide of this addiction, this opioid? And, and what are some of the culturally appropriate methods that we could use to assist that process? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And what can we do? What can you do? Culturally, to make Culturally. it a success. Well, like we can introduce something for them to do to to work their minds into doing something else other than what you know what the walking around trying to find something. We can teach them to sew. We can teach them, you know. Okay, you can make this. You can make that. You know, just you know, listen and. They, and uh, you know, that whatever the doctor is giving them, it helps for a while, but then they get addicted to that too. And they want more, and they want more, because they're not... The best thing is to encourage a person, okay, we're giving you this for a while, just to help you calm down, or just to help you not to have that craving for that. We're only helping you that, but we're going to wean you off. But it's up to you to help yourself. It's up to you to, to say no to what when you go out there. So how important it is, how important is it to involve Nazis, knowledge keepers in the current health system or the current treatment programs uh, to help our people that are addicted, how important it is to involve the elders in these treatment programs? Well, these treatment, these treatment centers, you know, they're trying to, like, a lot of, I know uh, when I go to St. Paul, they're trying to teach them the Blackfoot ways, the Blackfoot language, the Blackfoot this and that. You know, and a lot of them, you know, they just don't want to, do, they don't want to learn that. So the best way to do it is, you know, to go right into, uh, you know, what they have for treatment, not, not giving them anything, but like these lectures they have, these, these films they have. Like one time when I was at, when I first went into treatment, they, there was these people that came in and they showed us these, uh, these films, uh, these, well, they, that time there was a great big film, and they, they showed us about people in uh, Arizona that, had, that were addicted, well, that were alcoholics. They showed us this one, one couple uh, they had kids, and and it was the Mormons that showed us that. And the mother and the father, they just split up, and they sold all their while well, they sheep. Their, they had sheep, and they, they lived in huts. And I remember that's uh, called bitter winds. I think that's what it is. Anyways, I uh, <laughs> I remember that that film. It really hit me. You know, geez, because you know, like when when the last stages of my my dad, uh, I remember, you know, he was he was drinking quite a bit, and his favorite saying was, "Never mind, Charlie." <laughs>
But at th that time, it, after he was only 50 years old when he died. So I guess what you're saying is, when we introduce the indigenous experience yeah. into our treatment programs, that gives our people more connection. Yeah, more connection to the to Mother Earth. And more connection to their own spirit, more connection yeah. to what more connection to an understanding yeah. of how addiction affects yeah. families and yeah. affects the community and affects themselves. Especially this fentanyl. That's what you should try and do is to make a, a film you know, where a family can can play. The effects of fentanyl. Yeah, that's into that drug and how it's affect them and how, look at me, I lost two of my granddaughters and that's still in here. But, you know, like knowing how they died really really blew me up, you know, like just I didn't think it would ever happen in my family because I was uh I was sober and I was you know, I tried to keep my family connected to with each other and but when that happened but there was nothing I could do. There was nothing I could say to help her, to help the other one, and tell them, okay, it's bad, don't. And, you know, the only time I was able to help one of my children was when one was in the hospital. And I spent 24-7 with her. And that was two, two weeks, three weeks, I spent, I, Went home, I cooked for her, I brought it home, I brought it to her. I was there and I understood what she was going through. And she, she used to tell me, can you hold me? And I'd hold her because I was there. And that's what these families, I've heard a lot of mothers say, you know, uh, she's okay. She's all right. And I see, I see she's not all right. You know, and oh, I have her kids. You know, the kids are okay, but they're not. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a sad part of it. You know, for example, the parents, the grandparents. We need to support our kids are the ones that are addicted. We need to support them. We yeah, need to be with them. So, I mentioned earlier the 75 bed facility that's being yeah. constructed and developed. If you're asked today, what uh, what would you do to assist in developing a culturally appropriate treatment program for the facility? What would you put in place? Let me see. Well, because reconnection is an important reconnection to our spirit, our uh, faith, reconnection to family, the support systems, reconnection to ceremony. You mentioned. Um, you know, and then that faith is a, is a big one. So if you could just kind of, you know. You know, for example, is with us, with us natives, the circle. Make the rooms, make them into circles. That's how we connect, because everything goes around. You know, it's, it's, you go into a place like here, go in, there's a corner, there's a corner, there's a corner. We can't, you know, like, we have to have a circle. 
And that's one of the things they should think about is, okay, we... And what are some of the programs that you would... Some of the programs would be, you know, have some of the elders, you know, come in every day. There's all kinds of elders on the region. Have them come in every day. Have an elder come in, even weekends. Do you remember when uh, St. Paul had that um, detox? And I worked, I worked with Lester, me and Lester worked. I worked 24-7. I stayed right there with the clients. And I, 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 you know, I was right there when they were going through withdrawals. When they wanted to leave, I chased after them and bring them back in. And to this day, you know, a lot of them come come back and they all is right. Oh, there's mom, there's grandma, you know, like because I had patience. I had I had a lot to give. That love for people I have, that understanding. You know, that knowledge of who they are and who they want to be. They don't want to be where they're at. Because I've heard, I think each and every one of them say, I don't want to do it anymore. But as soon as they get out, they're back right back into it. Because they go into the same thing. Okay, and after this, that after that treatment, there should be an aftercare. There should be an aftercare at least two years because it takes over a year to get all that drug out of you. So, my final question is, if I was hooked on fentanyl and just down and out, and I came to you, and you know, I'm ready to go to treatment. What would you tell that person? Huh? What would you say to someone who just came off the street, who's ready to walk through that little window of opportunity? Yeah. What would you tell that person? And what would you do when you, if they came to you? I would, you know, I would welcome that person. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're doing something for yourself. I'm not going to say, oh, I'm so glad you're here for me. I'm so glad you're here for yourself. At least you're looking at yourself. You know, and you know Alvin Mills? That guy, he's, he's come to me a few times while he was on the street. You got a quarter, you got a dollar, yeah, yeah. And then he'd jump in my vehicle and say, geez, I want to quit, I want to quit, Auntie, I want to quit. Well, you're not going to quit if you don't take, if you don't look after yourself. You have to learn to look after yourself. And quit taking, quit drinking. Well, you know, growing up and growing up this and that, deal with it, talk about it, tell people, I went through this, I went through that, and I, it was really, it was, I was, this was done to me and that was done to me, and okay, deal with it, go on with your life, leave it behind, like, like when I was growing up with my mom, my dad, my dad and my mother were very protective, you know. They always, my dad always was on horseback and he'd be riding through the brush and, and if there's any stranger or anything, you know, he'll get them, he won't let them. And he always tells us, I don't like your uncle being too close to you, you know. And we were brought up, if, 
if, uh, if my brother was sitting there, I wasn't to go in, into that, into, you know, in front of him. I was, you know, wait till he left. Kuyinna, that means that's your brother, but you have to have that respect for him. Because, you know, like my dad always says, oh, all of us men have roaming eyes, you know, for, so he always, and even, even my uncles, my auntie, if there's boys in one room, we go in the other. The old man, the same thing. He says, ha, 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 mama Kripstalpi, why is she in here? When, you know, there's men. Me stop repeat. I have to go in the other room. You know, I could never sit among, uh, you know, be in there unless if I'm needed to serve him something or then my grandma would tell me, go give this to him. But other than that, I can't. Mm. So that's, you know, like, very seldom I'm alone with my brother Hugh. I never, I'm never around him. Same with Willie. Vernon was just like my child because I raised him when he was a little boy. Okay, so that's all I have. Um, any last comments on developing culturally appropriate traditional methods of treatment for Nixi, those struggling with opioid addiction? Any last comments on that? You know, that is the worst thing you can get into because it's addictive overnight. And try, you know, people should try and stay away from it. You know, like I said, painkillers, it started with pain. All of a sudden, codeine came in, and that's when all hell broke loose. <laughs>